All right, so we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I know you guys are extremely busy with everything, but you know this is a great session. Um, we've we've got two amazing speakers, but I always think about um, sepsis and AKI as two conditions that we commonly deal with, like all the time as internal medicine trainees. Um, the commonality of these conditions does not always equate with um, ease of diagnosis and management. Um, they have a propensity for not only being um, you know, timely detected and managed, and also might have eventual deleterious consequences for your patients. So we bring to you two eminent physicians in the respective fields um, to simplify these issues for us. Um, I've actually known both of these physicians um, since I've been an intern, and I continue to learn a lot from them. But we'll start off with Dr. Marciniak, who will be speaking on the topic of sepsis. Um, I'll introduce Dr. Marciniak now. Um, she completed her medical education at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, then completed an internal medicine residency at the Ohio State University Medical Center, and then did her fellowship training in pulmonary and critical care at the University of Maryland Medical Center, where she now serves as an assistant professor. Um, along with that, she is currently the assistant program director for the pulmonary and critical care fellowship program, along with being the associate program director for the internal medicine residency program at Midtown. Uh, without further ado, I'll pass on the mic to uh, Dr. Merciniak. It's all yours. Great. Thanks, Sam. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry that I'm having webcam issues right now, so you can pretend I look like whoever you want. Um, today we're, or tonight we're going to talk about um, sepsis, and that has to come with the disclaimer that there are so many nuances to sepsis and so many subtopics that there's just too much to cover in 25 to 30 minutes. And so I tried to pick three management goals. Uh, that we could hopefully talk about in the time allotted, and then um, left a lot of resources at the end for you to follow um, your passion uh, on whatever subtopics of sepsis that you might, um, you might be interested in. And certainly, I will be steadfastly avoiding discussing much about the kidney because that is not my specialty, nor was it even something I was at all uh, acceptable in as a resident, and we're, we're having an ex gonna have an excellent talk um, about uh, AKI, which we see in sepsis all the time um, after this. And so I will leave that to, uh, to my colleague. All right, so sepsis, basics, and a few myths here. So first of all, we've got to um, make sure we're all on the same page with what sepsis is. And if you look at the surviving sepsis guidelines, they define it as the body's pathologic response to an infection, which results in end organ damage. I think we could distill that down to infection plus organ dysfunction equals sepsis. And then septic shock is sepsis plus hypotension that's not responsive to fluids or lactate. Um, and you may be wondering why Kermit was visiting us here. So, so if you guys are not familiar with Kermit the Frog, he is sort of the original, the, the ringleader of the Muppets. And I wanted to bring him in for, to personalize sepsis because the creator of the Muppets, Jim Henson, died of septic shock due to a staph pneumonia. And so if you didn't know anybody that, uh, that was touched by sepsis before, now anytime you see a Muppet, you're going to be thinking about sepsis, which probably makes that sad, but also might help you in your uh, medical career. All right, so we, I told you we had three goals to talk about today. And the first goal is clearly the most important, and that's where we're going to start, which is that we have to recognize that someone has sepsis. Because if we don't recognize it, the other two don't matter. All right, so we'll start with the case and we'll, we'll try to, to recognize whether there's sepsis or not. Hint, we're talking about sepsis, so you might already have your cackles up there. So Mr. Watson's a 77-year-old man. He's coming into your urgent care with dysuria for three days. You can kind of see the rest of his history play out. So he's had a little bit of decreased urine output over the last day. Uh, he maybe had some chills. He's feeling achy and kind of like he has malaise. He hasn't taken his medications in the last couple days because he's been feeling very nauseated. And you can see his vital signs up here. And he's got some dry mucous membranes. He's tachycardic. And he has some suprapubic tenderness and CVA tenderness on the right. He, his skin looks fine, but his capillary refill is prolonged, right? We'd like that to be less than three seconds to get that nice uh, red color back, that, that blanching to go away. But his has taken a little while. And he's also taking a little while to answer some questions. And then just, just to round out his history, he has hypertension, hyperlipidemia. You can see his medications here. He takes one antihypertensive. Uh, he's no, no longer a smoker and a, a minimal drinker or a, a daily drinker, but not much. 
question mark. Uh, and he lives alone and is otherwise functionally independent. Uh, and then there's his family history. All right, so I am going to uh, open the chat box slash open uh, people who want to quick unmute themselves um, to ask you guys kind of what you notice about this case. And we'll take just a few, maybe 30 seconds or so to see what um, everybody is thinking about uh, this case. Where's the chat box? There we go. Don't be shy. Or be shy, that's okay. Either way, um, this is one of the pitfalls of me not being able to see you and kind of stare you down until you answer something. Um, but so, so we can, we'll, we won't take too much time with that. So I highlighted some of the things that I thought might be um, pertinent to this case, right? His HPI sort of suggests that there might be an infection going on here, right? He hasn't taken his medications. His vital signs are, are clearly abnormal. And I wonder about this blood pressure. Right, he's usually hypertensive. What's, what does he usually run when he's taking his medications? It's been two days since he's been taking his meds. Are we looking at a low blood pressure for him, even though it's, it may not quite get our get onto our radar? Right, he's got some dry mucous membranes. His capillary refill is decreased his, or is prolonged. His mental status is off. All those seem like end organ dysfunction to me. Uh, and then he's got some some possible localizing signs of infection here. Uh, in his GU system. So that's kind of what I was thinking. And so hopefully you guys were also thinking some of the same, uh, same things in this case and whether or not that might make us think this is maybe not just a GU infection, but perhaps actually sepsis due to a uh, pyelonephritis or a UTI, all right? So in order to recognize that a patient has sepsis, we probably have learned some um, criteria that perfect that will uh, that maybe help us with this, and one of them, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS criteria, brings us to our first myth. All right, so a myth that I want to make sure that we have dispelled. Hopefully, we already have, but just in case, um, a a patient without SIRS criteria or that doesn't meet the two SIRS criteria that we know used to go into the definition of sepsis can't have sepsis, all right? The, the truth and how I want you to think about it instead is that most patients with sepsis will meet the, the SIRS criteria, right, which involves, I didn't even put it up here because I know you guys must have already had that drilled into your head a thousand times, um, right? Temperature change, heart rate change, respiratory rate or PCO2 change, and certain white blood cell count, right, either less than three or higher than 12, right? And so if you have two of those plus an infection, that used to mean you had sepsis. But it turns out that um, they did a, a retrospective study now, I think 2014, um, in Australia and New Zealand and found out that if you just used that criteria, you missed one in eight patients with sepsis. And as we hopefully know, but certainly will be will know by the end of this talk, that every hour counts with sepsis. And the longer it takes to recognize it and treat it appropriately, the, in, the, the more the mortality increases, almost in a logarithmic fashion. So, so one in eight, missing one in eight patients is an unacceptable amount of patients to miss. So because of this, this SIRS criteria not being a, a acceptable um, diagnostic tool, uh, they came up with something you guys may be familiar with as well, which is called the QSOFA score. And this was actually designed to be able to do at the bedside where all you needed was a blood pressure cuff and the ability to count to 22. And if you had those two things, you could decide if somebody had sepsis based on, if you were, if, if someone was at increased risk for sepsis due to um, their QSOFA score, right? So if you have someone with an infection and they meet any of these criteria, then we need to think about, uh, the, the, then you're, you're concerned that the patient has sepsis, right? And if you look at them, they are three separate organ dysfunctions, right? So hypotension, cardiovascular dysfunction, altered mental status, neurologic dysfunction, their tachypnea, respiratory system dysfunction, right? So we, so we could distill this down even further to this, 
the bottom line is if you have a patient that you're seeing on the wards or in the emergency department or in an urgent care who you suspect or know has an infection, then the, the next goal you should have is to determine whether or not they have any end organ dysfunction. And you take that by system. You can go head to toe. You can go in your favorite rhyme scheme of systems. Whatever, what, however you make sure you hit all of the organ systems on your history and physical, do that and decide whether or not any of them are dysfunctional, right? So altered mental, we talked about these first three, these are the Q sofa, right? And then nausea, vomiting, um, diarrhea with a blood tinge could be like ischemic colitis. That can be how the GI system is showing you that it's suffering from poor perfusion. Obviously, poor urine output is a, a potential marker for decreased renal perfusion. I'll leave the renal discussion to later, uh, but that is, that's a, a potential um, organ dysfunction sign there. And then skin modeling, right? So, so if you have a patient whose skin um, is, is a tone that can show you modeling, which is sometimes hard in our darker skin tones, um, that is, that's one way that you can think that the, the peripheral vasculature is not functioning appropriately. Um, and even more helpful in, in any patient is, is capillary refill, like we talked about in our patient, Mr. W, right? So if they, if they have a prolonged or poor capillary refill, that should suggest to you that their peripheral perfusion is not normal. And any one of these things should make you think that the patient, your, your patient has sepsis and should trigger you to move on to the next goal. All right, and now in, in a perfect world, and in, in the, actually not a perfect world, in real life, not a lecture, um, you sh we should be doing both of these goals together, but we can only talk about one at a time, and so we'll talk about the, um, the more controversial one first and end with some more solid uh, information on the um, source control. So the... Adequate perfusion and, and maintenance of it and achieving the adequate perfusion is a, a source of a lot of debate and study currently. And if there's a way, uh, if you really wanted to get an ED doc or an intensivist fired up, this is a great way to, uh, it's a great topic to introduce. Um, so maybe if this talk is happening by me or someone else in two years, three years, maybe a year and a half, um, we may have some updated information, but for right now, the targets that we're still sort of shooting for are an, a mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeters of mercury or greater, and that's our macro circulatory, that's our big picture circulatory target. And then the micro circulatory targets are actually possibly a little more interesting these days. So the one we all know and love and or love to hate is lactate. Right, lactate is still the surviving sepsis guidelines recommended and sepsis bundle mandated microcirculatory perfusion marker. And so that we are obligated at this point still to target, uh, target, lactate, target our resuscitation to lactate. However, and if you only read one study about sepsis, uh, if you haven't read this one already, I highly recommend this one. So the Andromeda Shock Study, which is almost two years old now, actually um, randomized people to either septic patients to um, a, a resuscitation targeting um, normalization or improvement in capillary refill time or serial lactates with, with improvement in lactate as the target. And despite what its original... Um, conclusion was, it actually showed that capillary refill time was as good as lactate in as a uh, goal to resuscitation target. And uh, I highly recommend reading this and some of the editorials that followed because the editorials actually brought to light some of the, uh, the unrecognized um, Differences between the groups, which included that the micro, I'm uh, sorry, the um, capillary refill group actually got less fluid and less pressors, which ended up resulting in some improved downstream indices um, in terms of cognitive function and um, and uh, overall length of stay. We'll leave the kidneys out of this for right now because um, I'm sure we're going to get that addressed uh, a little bit later. 
Um, but it turned out that the the capillary refill group got less fluid and um, and did did a little better than the lactate group. And so that's something that, that I've certainly and, and several of my colleagues have been incorporating into our practice a little bit more uh, of a frequent um, capillary refill check rather than just depending on these lactates and targeting our resuscitation towards that. So let's talk about how we achieve these goals, right? Here's where the gray area comes in. So the first thing everybody thinks about when we're talking about uh, improving somebody's perfusion and hitting these circulatory targets is fluids. And that part's not wrong. That's not really a myth, but the, the myth part is always only thinking about fluids and not giving pressors a chance earlier. All right. So certainly maintaining adequate perfusion likely will include fluids. The pathophysiology of sepsis results in vaso, severe vasodilation, which means profound decrease in the systemic vascular resistance, which then impedes the venous return and therefore the stroke volume. So the tissues aren't able to see freshly, freshly oxygenated blood as much as they want to. Um, though they're seeing plenty of blood, it just isn't freshly oxygenated, right? And so that, that does, all that vasodilation does lead to a relative volume depletion. And if you add to that the insensible losses from the infection that stemmed the sepsis, you, you almost certainly have some form of relative volume depletion. And so most people are going to need some IV fluid. There's unfortunately still and may never be science that tells us how much fluid is right. All you guys might be thinking, wait a second, aren't we supposed to give 30 milliliters per kilogram? Isn't that the sepsis bolus? Wow, hard for me to say, apparently. Um, yeah, you are, you are right. That is the sepsis bolus. That is the guideline. That guideline is based on expert opinion and one pediatric study. And so we don't have any adult sepsis or adult septic shock studies that tell us that 30 milliliters per kilogram is better than 22 milliliters per kilogram or better than 34 milliliters per kilogram. We just, we don't have that information. So that, the fact that we don't have empiric evidence to, to tell us what the right goal, what the right fluid amount is, that leads to huge variation among doctors. So if you put me and all of my colleagues in a room with one septic patient, Mr. Watson, let's say, we're probably all going to have a slightly different um, amount of fluid that we're going to give before we start pressors. And if you, if you took uh, one intensivist and gave them six different patients with sepsis, they'll probably have slightly different plans for each of the patients. And so that, that is confusing to people that are starting out, right? Um, but it is, it is part of the art of medicine. And then certainly there's also some debate about what, what crystalloid fluid to give or whether to try to give albumin, and that's a topic I'll save for my colleague, or certainly if, if there are questions after all the talks are, are given, then I'm happy to try and address some of that. And there, I referenced some of the studies as well to, uh, at, at the end that uh, you can do some of your own reading. Um, and the, the key point with fluids is they're not a benign, a totally benign entity, all right? It, it may be better to think of them in the same context as blood products or medications, because there are there are harms that could be ha could happen with fluid, and if you, if you're looking at some of these sepsis studies that are at the end of this talk, uh, you'll notice that there are often worse outcomes in the groups that get higher amounts of fluid, whether that's mortality or increased length of stay or increased uh, severity of illness marker scores like the SOFA score or Apache scores. Um, it, there's a, a wide range of, of worse outcomes, but they're there. And so it's important to think about um, not just continuously giving fluids that, that may be to bring pressors in a little early, which has to lead to the question, when do we start that? Right? Well, an easy answer to that is, if the patient is not responding to fluids, you should start pressors. Right? So if you gave 30 milliliters per kilogram or whatever you decided was appropriate for that patient based on their comorbidities and your acumen, um, and they did, and they're, they're peripheral perfusion and their macro circulation, their blood pressure did not respond, well, then by all means, start the pressors because why would they, if you did your best thought about the fluids, then you should probably start them on pressors even if you choose later to give them some more fluid. The fluid does not seem like it's enough for that group, right? So that's kind of an easy one. The majority of your patients, though, are probably going to have some response to fluid. And so for someone like Mr. Watson, our, our case from earlier, 
I would consider starting fluids after giving him the 30 milliliters per kilogram. That's the guideline. He doesn't have any that we know of pre-existing severe cardiac disease or renal disease that might make me think of being more conservative. I'll tell you what doesn't make me think about being more conservative, whether or not I'm going to need to intubate them. All right. If, if, the, if I think the patient needs fluid based on all that I am seeing from a medical standpoint, then their respiratory status is not going to get in my way. And if needed, they will need to be intubated because we will, the, the patient needs the fluid they need, and we shouldn't, try, we shouldn't decrease that amount because we're afraid of what it might do to their respiratory status. All right, because that's not treating sepsis appropriately then. All right, so after the 30 milliliters per kilogram for Mr. Watson, I want to know how he did. Did his, his math come up? Did, he start, did his mental status start to improve? But we didn't quite meet our goals. Well, then I'm probably going to put him on pressors, first line, norepinephrine, right, and then decide whether I want to do a small fluid challenge while I'm standing there to see if he improves with the fluid and the pressure requirement comes down or his mental status gets better, then I know I'm going to keep giving him some more fluid. Or am I going to do some dynamic, check some dynamic indices like an ultrasound with, with looking at the IBC or uh, an, the I, and the IJ or passive leg raise or something, uh, depending on, on how kind of the temperament of the patient and, and whether they're intubated or paralyzed. It, it, the dynamic indices are, are applicable in different situations. Uh, but but I'm, I'm thinking about starting pressors after that initial bolus if they haven't shown a significant response. And if I'm thinking, if I'm starting pressors, I'm also thinking about whether or not they need stress dose steroids. And certainly if, if I'm increasing my norepinephrine to the point where I think I'm thinking about starting vasopressin too, so somewhere over 0.1 mil. Mill micrograms per kilogram per minute is my threshold. If I'm thinking about starting vasopressin to help decrease the amount of norepinephrine that I need, I'm also thinking about starting stress dose steroids. And I'm not checking any cortisols and I'm not checking any stim tests. I'm giving the steroids. All right. And then more importantly, I'm assessing them as often as I possibly can by looking at their vital signs and looking at their end organ perfusion. Is Mr. Watson's mental status now improving? Did I get his capillary refill down under three seconds? If so, then what we're doing is the right thing, right? If not, then we need to revisit what we're doing. Do we need to increase the pressures or do we need to start pressures if we haven't? Do we consider if the pressures are going up and we're still not reaching um, our targets, do we consider giving a, a, a small bowl of the fluid to see if part of the problem is we just don't have the blood volume, no matter how tight we squeeze our blood vessels with the pressor, right? And a little little reminder that our physical exam might be just as good and might save our patients some fluid rather than waiting on the lactate. And we can do this as frequently as we need to, right? In the study, they did it every 30 minutes uh, instead of having to wait for the lactate to come back. So that's, that's within our power. All right, so that's a lot of information about perfusion, and I'm happy to answer some questions afterwards, but let's, let's wrap things up with what should be our, our co-second goal here, which is obtain source control. And this brings, brings me to what I think is the most important myth here, which is that source control equals antibiotics or antibiotics equals source control. All right, the truth of this is antibiotics are certainly important, and they're definitely part of source control, but in a fair amount of patients, they're not the only thing we need to do for source control. Certainly, some infections only need antibiotics to be treated. But sometimes when we're localizing the infection to a certain area, there could be multiple sources for that area to be infected. And so we need to make sure that we're addressing all parts of the source. All right? And so first, we have to find it. Right? And so for our case, Mr. Watson, he was able to provide us with history, and we were able to take a physical that helped us, right? But we sort of localized his likely infection to the GU system, right? Either a UTI or, or maybe with the CVA tenderness pylo, right? So we, we would then culture things that made sense, right? We're probably not going to try to induce a sputum in Mr. Watson, who doesn't have any respiratory symptoms or signs of respiratory illness on his exam, right? So for Mr. Watson, we're going to be culturing his urine and his blood, 
right? If you have somebody who can't give you a history or physical, I'm sorry, who can't give you a history and their physical is unreliable, then we're going to need to culture everything we can, right? And especially if your patient, if, if you can't localize a source based on a history and physical, either because the, the source is nebulous or because they can't give you um, a history, then we need to image things. And for Mr. Watson, we think he, he probably has a UTI or, or pilo, right? But can we, based on physical exam and history alone, can we confidently say he, he does not have a stone that might be infected or obstructive? Can we confidently say he doesn't have a perinephric abscess? Right? We can't. And so for him, I would also get a non-contrast CT scan of his abdomen and pelvis to see if there's any fluid collections around the kidney. Yes, with a non-contrast CT, the, the first thing the radiologist is going to say is that we can't say for sure whether there's that an abscess or not. But most people shouldn't have a fluid collection around their kidney. And if in, in the right type of patient, like Mr. Watson, who we, who we are worried about a, an infection, um, either a pyelonephritis or a UTI, a fluid collection around the kidney would also be a source of infection to me, right? And then that, that non-contrast CT would also show us whether or not there was uh, a, a stone, both of which the obstruction, I'm sorry, the abscess and the stone would need to be addressed as part of his source control. All right, then, so after we try to find the source, we have to treat the source. And a thousand percent, this is where antibiotics come in, right? It has to be the right antibiotics. Let's say we give Mr. Watson the official sepsis cocktail of Maryland, which, which for those of you, if you're, if you're not familiar with that, would be vancomycin and piperacillin tazobactam or zosin, right? And let's say we give that to him, but he has an ESBL E. coli growing in his urine. We have done him nothing good, right? It's, it's like we gave him no antibiotics because he has a, his, and his bacteria are resistant to the ones we gave. So we need to also take some time in our history and physical to, and our chart review to see if they've had any previous cultures that we can go off of, if they, if they know if they've had a, a, a previous drug-resistant organism, or if they have any of the risk factors. Did they get antibiotics in the last 90 days? Do they have any indwelling catheters, ports, lines? Have they had any surgeries lately where they've been in the hospital, or, or have they been in the hospital where they may have picked up a drug-resistant organism? Right, we have to give the right ones, and we have to give them quickly. The the last study that I was going to reference is this one from 2017 that showed that we already had a significant increase in our adjusted odds ratio for hospital mortality between giving antibiotics between people that got an antibiotics within an hour of getting to the hospital, and between one and two hours after getting to the hospital. So this should tell us that how important it is for us to recognize sepsis as early as possible and give antibiotics as soon as we can. But that's not always enough. We need to drain any fluid collection. I guess the, the exception to that would be small bilateral simple appearing pleural effusions are probably not infected if they're bilateral small and simple fluid. But otherwise, we should drain fluid collections or get help draining them if we don't feel comfortable doing that, right? Antibiotics are probably not enough for a fluid collection or an abscess, right? And the same goes for infected tissue. Is there necrotizing fasciitis? Are we worried about a sacral decubitus ulcer infection or a, um, an infected hip joint, a replaced hip joint? Um, are there hardware or tissue that we need to remove? Antibiotics are not going to be enough here either. All right. And then the last thing I want to leave you with is that we have to constantly reevaluate your progress. Repeat in your head, sepsis is not a set it and forget it disease process. We need to decide if we're doing the right things for our patient. Is our patient getting better? If not, we need to reconsider the whole diagnosis. Were we wrong about septic shock? Are we sitting on a PE that we haven't been treating correctly? Are we sure it's septic, septic shock? Okay. Then are we sure we've gotten the whole source? Yes? All right, then. Are we sure we're treating it right? Let's revisit those antibiotics. All right? Or yes, the patient is getting better. Celebrate and start de-resuscitation, right? See if you can get rid of some of that fluid that, that you gave them that's now probably sitting in their peripheral um, space, like their legs or their uh, presacral area, right? Tailor the antibiotics. Get them up and moving around. Get PT and OT in. Get them talking to their family to help with some of the cognitive and functional debilitation that comes with sepsis and septic shock uh, so that you can do the best for your patients and get them out of the hospital before they get a hospital-related uh, infection or a hospital-related complication. All right, so we 
we had to speed through that a little bit, but the, the main points are don't miss sepsis. We all have done it, and, and it, you know, you live and learn, but don't miss it. Look for organ dysfunction in your infected patients. Once you see it, start getting their, their perfusion, start improving their perfusion with fluids initially and then pressors earlier than you think. It's okay to give them through a peripheral IV. Don't let lack of central access be the reason they don't get pressors. All right? Find and treat the source the, the best way and the, the most efficient, fastest way that you can to help with this mortality. All right? I'm happy to take any questions and or comments. Um, now, and I'll just, while we're looking for some of those, I will just put up some of these articles that I recommend. Please do not feel like you have to read all of them ever or all of them in a night. Um, but these are just some of the studies that will help you kind of understand where we are with sepsis now. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Mersini. I, I was uh, pretty much transported back to the MICU. I'm hearing all those things from the current <laughs> Uh-oh. PTSD yeah, it's, for Sam, it's, it's always such a great reminder, uh, I'll be honest. Um, but um, I move on to questions. Um, Appy yes. Chu asks, um, does giving steroid among patients with septic shock uh, increase severity of infection? Oh, I, that's an excellent question, Appy. So, so here's, here's the, the thing about wh why we give the, the steroids that we give. It is because we think the patient is under so much stress that they cannot possibly make enough endogenous steroids to maintain their, their cardiovascular system's ability to get the perfusion that we need. And so it, the, the small possibility of potentially immunosuppressing them further to make their, their infection more severe, it, it is outweighed by the potential benefit of keeping them alive long enough to treat the infection anyway. Uh, so while there is very possibly a small amount of, of the small chance that you might increase the severity of infection, most of the studies, two of which I think are um, down here somewhere, um, they don't actually have any evidence to support that you, you actually worsen that infection. And we're giving, I'm sorry, I should have probably said, we're giving hydrocortisone uh, as opposed to maybe a very high-dose prednisone or solumedrol that you might more associate with uh, the immunosuppression. Oh, I see this next question. I just popped up my chat box, uh, and I see a next see question so, which says, yeah. yep. So Ronin uh, Ni um, asks, um, how to approach uh, fluid resuscitation in patients with um, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or advanced kidney dysfunction, not on dialysis? That, that's an excellent question. And honestly, essentially my entire life when I'm up working there, there this, is, this is like the holy grail of, of intensivist questions. And I, I would be very interested to, to hear um, that what Dr. Sparks has to say about the, the renal failure, because honestly, a lot of my answer to that question is I'm going to probably put them on short-term dialysis if I think they need fluids. Uh, I'm not going to be as worried about the kidney and the, um, the potential respiratory consequences of, uh, of giving them more fluid and having it back up to, into their lungs because I'm probably going to try to put them on dialysis if, if their renal function is already a, Pretty, or the renal dysfunction is already pretty advanced. The sepsis or septic shock is probably going to make that worse. Um, but uh, the, the way that I tend to approach people who have either advanced cardiac or renal dysfunction with, their, with fluids is I will, I will give them a small bolus at a time. These are not the patients I'm giving 30 milliliters per kilogram all at once and kind of leaving, walking away and going to see some other patients. I might give them either 500 milliliters to a liter at a time while I'm there to see what it does, to see, it, to see where they are in their volume status. Because we've all seen patients who have uh, reduced ejection fraction who still need fluid, right, who are still relatively volume depleted. So I'm sitting there at the bedside with them, possibly with an ultrasound, trying to look at their IVC and their IJ to see if that helps me determine their, their 
the likelihood that they will respond favorably to fluid, and I'm watching them and seeing if what I'm getting is an improve with my leader fluid that I'm giving them, is their blood pressure coming up and their heart rate coming down and their breathing not really changing, or am I seeing them start to get more tachypnic but not getting the blood pressure results I want? If that's the case, then I'm switching to pressure. So if that, I will give them a fluid challenge at while well, I'm at the bedside, and and based on how they respond, that's what will determine if I give them more fluid or give them um, pressures. Excellent. Um, thank you, thank you, Dr. Marciniak. Um, we'll move on to the next talk. Um, I'll, Dr. Sparks will be talking about uh, basic SMITs and updates in acute kidney injury. Uh, but let me introduce Dr. Sparks. I actually know him since an intern, was an intern as well, just like Dr. Marciniak. Um, Dr. Sparks completed his medical education, internal medicine residency at the University of Arkansas, um, where he also served as a chief resident. He then completed his nephrology fellowship at Duke University, where he currently serves as an assistant professor. Uh, Dr. Sparks is currently uh, the associate program director of the nephrology fellowship program, along with um, the director of the medical student research um, in the Department of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Sparks, I'll pass on the mic to you now. Um, look forward to hearing from you. We're ready for you, Dr. Sparks. I think you have to unmute yourself. Ah, uh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Got it. Yep. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to talk about this topic. Um, and just to, as a disclosure, this is not an area of research for me. My area of research is in the renin angiotensin system, hypertension pathogenesis, but um, it's a, a frequent area of what I see uh, in my clinical practice. So um, give a, a few disclosures that I have. Um, None of these have any financial conflict, but I will talk about a few of them. Uh, NEFJC, Renal Fellow Network, and I'm a member of the EBIM Nephrology Board. So the outline for my talk, one, um, why does AKI matter in the ICU? We talked a little bit about that uh, earlier. Um, how is AKI diagnosed clinically? And just a very brief discussion on that, and we could have a whole several hour talk on it, um, but really getting to the meat is busting two myths in AKI. Since it's a short talk, I really want to make this evidence-based and give you something to go home with. So what about AKI and how prevalent, how often does it occur, and what, what does it mean? So 57% of patients will develop AKI within the first week of admission to the ICU. And you know, different studies have different numbers, but it's also dependent on how it's defined. And this is sort of all comers from stage one, two, three AKI, and that's just minor uh, increases in creatinine. We'll talk a little bit more about um, the different methodologies people use for defining AKI. In this same study, though, 14% uh, of those individuals require dialysis, and that's pretty shocking. And I mean, as you, if you know, if you round in the ICU, you see a lot of patients um, in the ICU um, and for a variety of reasons from the SICU to the neuro ICU, cardiovascular ICU and from sepsis. And this has a profound impact on patients. And in fact, if you look at uh, the average mortality rate of someone who has AKI from sepsis who, who's on dialysis, compare that to patients that um, have sepsis without AKI or have an MI in the ICU or have ARDS with mechanical ventilation, you see that the mortality rate is, is quite high at almost 50%. So it has also been shown to be an independent risk factor of death. So that is really uh, striking and it's why we really need to, um, to, to be on the lookout for AKI and a lot of research is going in to try to understand how can we diminish um, the morbidity associated with, with AKI. The other thing about AKI is it really increases the cost of care. And there's a recent study a couple years ago that showed that for each individual patient that needed dialysis from AKI, and these patients weren't on dialysis before, 
uh, increases uh, the bill uh, up to fifty thousand dollars. Someone say something. I think somebody might have their microphone not muted. So these are uh, are significant issues. One, you have a lot of AKI. AKI is independent risk factor for death. And then it's a very expensive um, condition to treat. And, and so the nephrology community has done a lot to try to unify the diagnosis so that things are more apples to, to oranges when we're talking about AKI. And I'm not gonna talk about the ACAN criteria or all these different, well, I'm, I'm talking about KDGO, which is a very commonly used approach to diagnosing and staging AKI. And this has a lot of, of this will, will kind of pertain to the prognosis um, but also um, in clinical trials helps to put people in the different categories. So stage one AKI is about one to two times, one and a half to two times the reference or what their baseline is, or an increase greater than or equal to 0 0.3 milligrams per deciliter of creatinine. Um, and stage two is about two to three. And then stage three is greater than three times their baseline or greater than four or than, um, or than, uh, need for dialysis. And these are coming under intense scrutiny now, mainly because a creatinine centric approach does not really get us in the time frame of where the injury occurred. I'm not going to go into the whole biomarker story. There's a lot that are that are out and happening. We're trying to figure out how to use them appropriately um, and how not to use them. Um, and we're going to talk more about a few clinical trials, but the other, there is a second part and that's the, the urine. And, and this has been a very tricky part because it's exceedingly difficult to get uh, good measures of urine output in the hospital. And so these, um, although I, I show them there, um, I think they, they are very tricky to try to, to get and use and, and use it in, 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 in the staging. And I will also say in clinical practice, we don't use these stages very much. Um, in research, we do, but we don't typically write in the chart, uh, they have stage two AKI, they have stage three. So that also makes reading the literature very challenging because it's hard to put a frame of reference around what an individual person have has and then what was seen in a clinical trial. So, and these also were published back in 2012 and that's been almost a decade now. My guess is we'll have some new guidelines coming in the next few years that will also incorporate um, some of the new biomarkers that you can actually use now, like NephroCheck. So I wanna give a plug for uh, the examination of urine sediment. I think there is a renaissance in nephrology. We're sort of going back to our roots. And if you go to Renal Fellow Network, which um, you know I gave a conflict of interest, we have this uh, urinary sediment of the month. And uh, one thing that you notice and you see uh, is the presence of these granular and muddy brown casts in the urine. And, this, and the, these bottom ones in C and D are stained uh, with a Steinheimer Malbin stain, which is a really cool thing if you ever want to give it a shot. And then you also see the presence of tubular epithelial cells. And both of these are hallmarks of acute tubular necrosis. And there have been studies to look at the urine sediment and try to prognosticate you know, how severe the injury is. So you look at the creatinine, the urine output, and then you can look at the urine sediment. And you can see that if you have um, no granular cast and no um, renal tubular epithelial cells, then you sort of have a score of zero. One to five per low power field for the granular cast gives you a one. And then you can sort of see that um, um, one to five um, of the renal tube epithelial cells gives you a point. You can get a total of four points. And so um, Mark Parazella and Chirag Parikh, um, I think when he was at, back when Chirag was back at Yale, uh, did the study 2010. Um, and they looked at the score from zero and they lumped the three and the four together. And they sort of see like right when they got the consult, what happened? Did they have worse AKI after the consult? You know, occasionally nephrology we consulted and it's amazing. It's like, like the nephrology fellow scares the AKI away, like right when you see the patient or right when you call them the next day, the creatinine's down. So that does happen. But you see, if you had a higher score, then 
then those are more likely to get worse after that initial consult, more likely to require dialysis or die. And so I think that's another thing that we forget is that these are additional things that you can um, think about when you're seeing a consult or you have a patient with AKI uh, when you're prognosticating sort of what's going to happen. Okay, so that's really all I want to talk about to try to frame this and say, all right, AKI is prevalent. We know if patients get it, it's bad. It costs a lot of money. Um, and it's been very frustrating to do research on this topic, uh, especially in the ICU. Uh, we've had high versus low intensity dialysis. We've had CRRT versus uh, standard dialysis and nothing has really shown a real big uh, benefit. And in the last five years has really been um, a lot of cutting edge clinical research in this area. And I'm gonna highlight two of those studies. So myth number one, early dialysis in the ICU will improve outcomes. So, um, and, and different ICUs have different sort of feelings about this, but the thought is, is, hey, I don't want someone to get volume overload. Let's just start them on dialysis. And then we can just take care of everything and we don't have to worry about the fluid question. We just started them on dialysis. We don't have to worry about them developing hyperkalemia at two in the morning when the nephrology fellow is asleep. We don't have to worry about acidosis, everything, all those things we be taken care of by dialysis. And so that is going to be uh, help, help the patients. And so that's myth number one. And we've had four or five really um, good clinical trials conducted over the last several years. I'm going to talk about one of them. And it's a STAR AKI trial, and it was just published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's hard to believe everything that was crazy that happened last year was really an amazing year for the field of nephrology. A lot of really high impact, uh, high impact research. So what is the uh, START AKI trial? And it was a trial that looked at the timing of the initiation of dialysis in the ICU setting. It's not you know, it, it, the type of dialysis is up to the discretion of the providers. They want to do CVVHG, they can do it. They want to do SLED, they can do that. They want to do uh, standard dialysis, they can do that. So this is a, a multinational randomized open label trial in the ICU. This is the largest clinical trial to look at this question that's ever been performed. Um, and I just included some of the bigger countries that Australia, Canada, France, UK, US, all were involved, 162 hospitals. So really that's impressive. All the other studies um, were either single country or single center. They were much smaller. And so that really makes this a very important trial to look at. So what was it? Um, it was uh, a, a trial of, di of dialysis in the ICU, like I'd mentioned, 18 years or older. And you had to be admitted to the ICU and basically have a uh, creatinine go up from uh, 1.13 to 1.47 baseline in the ICU. And then you have to have KDGO stage two or three AKI, which I've already told you about that. So it basically has to go from a creatinine uh, two times the baseline or greater than four, but you had to have an increase. So I like, can't come in and it's just four and your baseline is four has to be four and then go up to 4.3. You also had to have uh, urine output decrease um, in 12 hours, um, 450 milliliters. So they randomized patients into two uh, different groups. And we'll talk about the standard group. And I'll say, this is the usual care group. This is what we're taught. This is what nephrology fellows uh, are do usually uh, is come and say, um, you, you know, you get a call from the ICU and you say, okay, what's going on? And you basically don't start dialysis until there is a clinical indication um, that's refractory to medical management. So um, they have to have hyperkalemia, acidosis, they have to have uh, respiratory failure and volume overload. There were some parameters around that. I, I, I wanted to make this as sort of succinct as possible so you can learn something from this. Um, and then you have to have AKI um, for 72 hours after randomization, just to ensure that these actual people had AKI. And then the second group is the experimental arm. That's the accelerated group. 
And these individuals, right when they got randomized with those KDGO guidelines, which some of those aren't too bad, you know, see a patient with a creatinine of two, their baseline was one, you know, you're not going to be like, hey, let's go ahead and start on that person. So this is a really accelerated uh, group. And these patients had to start dialysis within 12 hours of meeting full eligibility criteria. So here's uh, sort of a, a real brief overview. And, and most of uh, the, the group was, was really well um, uh, represented, but you see it's 1400 patients in each group. I mean, that is amazing. You know, that is some data that we have never seen before. The creatinine at baseline was about 1.4. The creatinine upon entry uh, was 3.6 in the standard group, 3.4 in the accelerated group. Uh, the other thing I think is important for us to recognize is 66 and 68% were in the MICU, meaning many of these patients just had sepsis. And that, that's important because the ELANE trial, which I'll talk a little bit about, was mainly in the SICU and were patients that had cardiovascular, uh, sorry, had uh, cardiovascular surgery. Um, 75, 78% were mechanically ventilated. So these were actually sick patients. Um, and then I just want to, you know, talk a little about the cabbage because that's a known uh, cause of AKI and a fairly well known because you know they had surgery, so eight percent in both groups, and then, and then trauma was four percent, which really is a different uh, subset of patients. And so, um, you know, I think for us as internists, uh, this is a study that I want to see the result, right? Like this is really interesting uh, to see this. So. The first thing in any study, what you have to see is, did they have a separation in what they were studying? Because if they didn't, then what's the point of actually, you know, uh, looking at the results? So there was a large separation. And you see in the accelerated group, basically just about everybody started on dialysis. And there were a few patients that didn't. And, you know, there, you know, there was a wiggle room before like, hey, you can't, you don't have to do it for if you have other, you know, if you and also you died, you know, you can't go on dialysis and this is the patients that died. And then look at only 50% or so in the, um, sorry, only 50% of uh, patients in the standard arm ever needed dialysis um, in, in the uh, seven days of, of enrolling in the study. So, um, Okay, so let's see what they showed. And I think this is really interesting is um, they did not show a, a difference in survival at all. So there was really no difference in the accelerated and standard arm throughout the 90 days since randomization. And that's one group, um, a whole bunch of people getting dialysis and 50% or so getting it in, this, in the uh, standard, standard arm. So. I think that's a really important um, piece of information to know. You're not going to save their life by doing dialysis really early. And uh, there are some issues with how early they began. I mean, in many of these instances, I don't know if I would necessarily pull a trigger that early. So what about the subgroups? And I had mentioned earlier about the Elaine trial, and that's why I really wanted to, to show you this. And you go to the subgroup of the ICUs, a surgical versus medical ICUs, you can see the numbers here. Remember how I said the Elaine group did better in the accelerated strategy, the early group in that study, it's a single center trial in Germany. If you look here, the surgical side actually definitely wasn't on the accelerated side and maybe even more on the standard side. So I think this is a really important piece of this study to look at because this subgroup is about as large as Elaine and it's multinational. And so there have been a lot of push to say, well, from the medical ICU, you don't do accelerated, but from your surgical ICU, you do. But this here is arguing that uh, there's no difference. And if anything, maybe standard is a better approach. So that's a, the second point I wanted to make about this study. The other thing is really important to look at here is these patients were randomized and look what happened. This was significant. More patients in the accelerated group were left on dialysis. And that's one thing you're gonna have to come to terms with. If you push dialysis earlier, it's more likely they're not going to come off. And why is that? 
I think it's probably a multitude of factors from hypotension, from um, it's just hard to stop dialysis because you have to really put a lot of time and effort to really think about, can this person come off dialysis or not? And so if you look here in these groups, so there's probably about um, 35, 40 more patients in standard arm that, uh, that weren't on dialysis compared to the um, accelerated uh, group. So that's, that's one thing I wanted to, to mention here. So here are the studies. And you know this is a brief overview of this study. I only have 30 minutes, so I didn't want to go into too much detail, but I mentioned Elaine, uh, 230 patients, single center in Germany, mostly in the SICU. Uh, Godry uh, came out just right after that. This is a Kiki, really amazing trial too. It's all in one country um, and there was no difference, okay? Um, you look at how many people had dialysis, it was almost everyone in Elaine. Akiki, um, very similar to start AKI. And then you had the ideal ICU, about 500 patients in, in France uh, also had uh, no difference in mortality. So if you look here in the mortality rates of early versus late, you see that there was a decreased mortality in the Elaine study. And I've already sort of given you a little bit of understanding about why that, potentially why that was. Uh, and then a Kiki, nothing, ideal, nothing, start AKI, nothing. There was a little bit of a diminished length of stay in the ICU in the accelerated group of start AKI. However, all the other parameters, which I mentioned, and the fact that most more patients were on dialysis long um, after they left the ICU uh, makes an early start a really, or accelerated start, um, you know, not an ideal uh, strategy. So uh, just to wrap up myth one, uh, the reality of early start ICU, will it improve outcomes? Um, it does not result in improved outcomes and results in more, more patients on dialysis. So the current approach is to still start dialysis when clinical indications arise, which are refractory to medical management. You know, this is a big statement, of, statement to make, but I will say that um, this is a clinical study. It's a lot of patients. The individual decision is nuanced and challenging. And oftentimes um, you're gonna have to make decisions about when to pull the trigger or not. And I think the first uh, talk uh, really went into some of the, the more nuanced discussion points about this. But I think knowing these clinical trials is very important. Okay, I wanna switch gears a little bit. So if you're a nephrologist, you know Burton Rose, you actually can tell what vintage a nephrologist is by what Burton Rose book they had. And, and for me, it was this one here, the Black Clinical Physiology of Acid-Based and Electrolyte Disorders. This is the Bible. This is what we preach, this is what we teach. And uh, it, it is something that is revered. If you pull up their discussion about Ringer solution, you'll note that one, they say there is no evidence that these solutions offer any advantage when compared with isotonic uh, saline. Furthermore, lactate ringers should not be used in lactic acidosis. So thinking no role in the ICU and that's what we were taught and that's how we practice medicine. That's how I practice medicine. Luckily, uh, we began to study um, LR, lactate ringers, physiologic and balance solutions. So myth number two, Normal saline is the fluid of choice. Burton Rose said it in his book, so we should use that. Here is a nice overview of all the fluids. And I will reiterate that fluids are medicines and you need to know what is in them. This is very frustrating as a nephrologist to get calls and people dumping uh, amps of bicarb into normal saline, just absolutely insane. Know your fluids. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but we're going to go through a couple that we're going to talk about. Plasmolite, um, normal saline, and lactate ringer. So let's pull those out so we don't have to look at everything else. And we, we can look at sort of uh, the differences here and see one of the biggest glaring issues is uh, chloride. I'm not going to go to other talk about lactate, we can, I can, you can ask questions about that, uh, or the pH as a solution, you can ask questions about that. But the, really, the, one of the glaring differences 
is the amount of chloride content. And two, plasma light and lactator ringers have a normal uh, chloride content, physiologic. And uh, the saline has a very high uh, level of chloride content. So what, what does that mean exactly? What is that, is that of any consequence? Um, we have to go back to physiology a little bit and physiology is what I do. And so I have to have a little bit of discussion about the nephron. So I'm gonna talk a little about tubular glomerular feedback. This is a very important concept that has really regained a lot of attention, um, not just because of this, but because of um, how SGLT2 inhibitors work. So let's, let's dive a little deeper into this beautiful structure here. So um, in order to understand tubular glomerular feedback, you've got to jump into the glomerulus and the apparatus surrounding the afferent, efferent arterial and the macula densa. And so that's right here. If you just zoom into that, you get this really cool structure called the macula densa. And this is where the glomerulus can take a little test, a little taste of what is happening distal in the nephron. So it's, the, it's these really specialized collecting duct cells that abut the um, afferent and efferent arterial and it can sense what's happening there. So how does it do that? Uh, before we do that, I wanna talk a little bit about um, um, the cell types that are around the macula densa. So uh, right next to the tubular uh, lumen, um, you have got this NKCC2 co-transporter, which y'all know that that is um, a very important co-transporter of the kidney. And that can sense chloride, potassium, and sodium in the tubular lumen. And when that becomes high, it can actually bring it into the cell. You also have uh, the um, <clears throat> extra capillary um, mesangial cells and uh, the granular cells. And these are sort of all around, um, around there. So let's talk a little bit. So that's the cell types that make up the macula densa. And here is the constituents again, just to remind you. And um, I'm going to replace the saline with a uh, salt shaker because, um, you know, that's really what it is. And what happens when you dump that into the body? It goes into the distal nephron and gets sensed and brings in and turns on this NKCC2. And then that comes in, increases sodium intracellularly into the cell, brings in water, and ATP is generated. Um, for this in, um, sodium potassium ATPase, that, uh, that adenosine then comes out and then binds and hits the um, granular cells in the afferent arterial, increasing the calcium intracellularly, causing vasoconstriction, and that decreases GFR. And this is a physiologic mechanism to protect the organism from basically just losing urine whenever you have damaged nephrons so like, for instance, if your proximal tubules are damaged to the point where you can't reclaim that sodium or chloride, all of that gets dumped out to your distal nephron. It notices that and says, hey, we cannot lose this much solute. We got to stop this. And that is where vasoconstriction can occur to the glomerulus, decreasing the GFR, and it can lead to a vicious circle causing AKI and eventually kidney failure. So it's a physiologic mechanism that hey, are we perturbing this by resuscitating people with chloride? And this is a tough one for nephrologists and internal medicine doctors to reckon with because we basically went and said, hey, who cares? It's saline, just give it. It's not gonna be any, any problem at all. So this study came out 2018 called SMART and was published simultaneously with SALT ED, SALTED, uh, which was done in the emergency room. And I'm not going to talk about that study. I'm just going to talk about this one. It was done in the ICU. So what was SMART? It's balanced crystalloids versus saline in critical, critically ill adults. Fluids are really hard to study. Um, and, and often uh, that is why we haven't really studied them a lot because you give them a lot. You don't really have solid indications. It's hard to blind. And so uh, what did this group do? So this was done at a single center, which is an issue with the study, but um, I think it's done quite well. It is five ICUs in a single center. So the MICU, trauma ICU, SICU, neuro ICU, and the cardiovascular ICU all were involved in this. 
it was called a pragmatic cluster randomized multi -cro multiple crossover trial. And so what that means, the pragmatic trial, that basically means the uh, IRB looked at this and said, hey, we basically think these two fluids have equal relevance, right? And you can use either one. So the patients aren't being exposed to anything that potentially is going to be harmful. Therefore, we don't have to have consent for the patients and we can just randomize the entire ICU. And so that, that's what that means. Uh, and it's multiple crossover because one ICU would switch every other month to one, one to balance solutions, one to saline. The other thing is the patients, clinicians, and investigators, they were all aware of the group assignment. So they knew uh, if their patients were, were in, the, in, in the study, which one they were not in. 15,000 patients, almost 16,000 patients admitted to the five ICUs. It was over like a, a one to two year period, depending on which, I, which ICU you're on. So the MICU, trauma ICU, and SICU are all in the same grouping. On odd months, they had lactated ringers. I just put LR, but they could also receive plasma wipe up to the discretion that they could use either one. And even months, uh, they would use saline. And then um, just opposite of that, the neuro ICU and the cardiovascular ICU started uh, on even months with LR balanced solutions and odd, odd ones with, with saline. And depending on the ICU, uh, they, were, they did this for either 12 months to 22 months. And really one of the major things they excluded for was age less than 18. And, and so some of the units like neuro ICU, they did occasionally have patients, a lot of patients under 18. And in the end, they uh, only excluded a couple hundred patients and 15,000 in the, in, in the um, primary analysis and 7,800 and 9,000, 7,900 in LR group. So that's really impressive. <laughs> that's a lot of patients. Um, however, you'll see that when you have that many patients, you can have statistical differences um, that maybe not have a big um, physiologic or a clinical effect, but we can talk about that. So I needed to, re to remind you, this is a pragmatic cluster randomized single center study. They did not have consent. They had an electronic advisor that sort of popped up on the um, computer and that basically informed about the trial, the relative contraindications. Uh, and there were some like um, in, they're in the neuro ICU that they had to give you know, uh, high saline or uh, high sodium concentration fluids, they wouldn't be enrolled. Um, they had liver failure, um, things like that. They uh, were excluded, not many had to be excluded. Patients, clinicians, investigators knew about it. The other issue is um, occasionally have patients that maybe get admitted at the end of the month, you know, what happens? So <clears throat> there was crossover of patients that would start in one and then they would switch to another. And so they would be exposed to both types of crystalloid. And so um, in the supplementary data, they sort of have all the information about how much crossover they have. It was pretty similar in both, but not, a, not as much as, as you would think. So those were uh, sort of uh, how they did the study. And they did the same thing in emergency departments, uh, emergency rooms throughout Vanderbilt. And uh, that's a separate study. So here are the uh, primary outcomes. And this is a term which is, you know, I think pretty now after actually after this study, you see it used more often. It's called MAKE, Major Adverse Kidney Events. And you know, for a nephrologist to see, wow, they're actually having a big trial with something we use all the time and they're looking at kidney outcomes. So this is really important to look at here. The other thing to recognize though, is just as we talked before, you know, in sepsis, it's all about source control or why do they have sepsis? This is a very much a secondary issue. I mean, uh, patients that need fluid, you're not gonna fix their problem, you know, like, uh, so, you know, how much of an impact can you make in someone's um, disease process? So this is a com composition of death, new dialysis, they call this persistent AKI. Basically the final creatinine is greater than 200% of the baseline. And occasionally they did not have uh, baseline creatinines so they did, like computed it based on um, like average creatinines for whatever the age and uh, comorbidities that the individual had. The secondary out outcomes were in hospital death before ICU discharge, ICU free days, ventilator free days, vasopressin free days, 
And then um, AKI stage two or worse, persistent AKI, new dialysis, highest creatinine during the, the hospitalization, a change in creatinine or the final creatinine. So really a lot of kidney implants, which is important because that is uh, what we had talked about is part of the rationale for using LR over saline is that potentially might not have that vasoconstrictor response from that um, tubal glomerular feedback. So uh, remember how I said earlier, you need to look at, is your study actually having a difference? And so um, chloride, we know when you have someone on a lot of saline, the chloride goes up. The one thing to remember about this is the y-axis is very compressed here. So it's three to six. So really not a big difference. But if you look at it, it stays significant over the entire time. And there are patients that have larger effects than others. And if you look at how much fluids these individuals had, it was about two liters. So they weren't getting a ton of fluid. But I'm sure that if some had a whole lot of fluid, that you, those are the ones that would, would have the largest increases of, of, chlor, of chloride. So what about, about bicarbonate? And the other thing is that you, you know about um, saline is that it causes um, a metabolic acidosis. And so again, y-axis is really just not, it's 22 to 25, but there's a difference throughout the infusion period as well. Something we always worry about uh, with LR is it has potassium in it. Um, it's about four milliequivalents per liter, so not a lot. So you think about, you know, it's four milliequivalents only in a, in, a, in, a, in a liter of fluid. And so there's really no difference in potassium in the two groups, no statistical difference. And then what about sodium? And so that's another thing is there's a little higher sodium content. Uh, 154 versus 144. And so the saline group did have a statistically significant increase in, in sodium content throughout the um, first seven days in the ICU. But this still, it's, uh, you know, so many patients, you can have a statistical difference, but it's not, uh, I don't think it's not, not much of a clinically meaningful difference. So what about the primary outcome? So we talked about it, make is what they've measured, LR, um, and then the salt, saline group. And you see, interestingly enough, the composite of all of these was significant at 0.04. And as I mentioned earlier, is this a clinically meaningful significant? I think it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to say, but if you think about how often we use fluids around the world, maybe this can make a difference. Um, interestingly enough, the receipt of new dialysis or renal replacement therapy, how they refer to it here, uh, was very close to being significant. So the saline group had 2.9% versus 2.5 in the balanced crystalloid group. So, I mean, that, that's interesting too. Uh, I mean, and for something as what we thought as innocuous as fluids to potentially actually alter outcomes um, in, in a trial that does have caveats, it's pragmatic, it's single center, but I think this is really kind of provocative here. So what about some of the kidney outcomes that, you know, like, well, if it does all those things and improves things, like it better have big effects in the kidney, right? I mean, less AKI. Well, they really didn't see a statistically significant effect. However, again, uh, 0.09 was a p-value and you see there was definitely more in the saline group versus LR. And this is the change from baseline to highest value, which is not significant either. So uh, the secondary outcomes were not significant, but I think trending towards a, uh, a little bit of a signal in the um, positive signal in LR. And then you have the primary outcome, which was significant. So let's go to some of the subgroups. And um, I think, you know, uh, medical, cardiac, neurologic trauma and surgical subgroups um, looks like the one that really um, was better on the balance of all of them was a neuro ICU and the cardiac one was more sort of like right in the middle. So, and then the medical ICU was a little bit on the balance. So just to kind of look at them, they did not, these are definitely not uh, pre-specified um, primary outcomes, but with that many patients, I think it's worth at least looking at that and, and, and seeing. The other thing is, you know, surgical ICU has been using LR for a very long time. And then what about categories of kidney function? Now, there were patients that were on dialysis. They, they didn't exclude those individuals from the trial. And in order to, to make 
the uh, primary outcome, they had to have uh, death because they're already on dialysis. Um, and so you see if they had normal kidney function, they're a little bit over to the line, acute kidney injury, maybe favoring the LR, chronic dialysis and the patients that were previously on uh, dialysis. I think that's just, a, I mean, it wasn't, it's just a small number of patients. So this is not the first time this is looked at. So there's three clinical trials that have been published. Um, now the, they're not uh, randomized, blinded. Uh, most of them are very similar design to this. They are ICUs that are pragmatically sort of switched to one thing or the other. But I remember very vividly in 2012 when the UNO study was published in JAMA, that we were very excited about this. Back then we thought, wow, 760 patients, that's a big study. And you see um, the balanced solutions was much lower and also the AKI was much lower. So that really, people were really sort of thinking then the split study came out in 2015 and it was a negative trial. There was no difference, maybe a little bit better in the balance, but not enough to have any statistical significance. So people sort of like, eh, okay, maybe there's something wrong. You know, this was a single center study. Um, this effect size is way more than anyone would ever anticipate. And then when SMART came out 2018, um, it sort of got people back on the bandwagon to think, well, maybe, maybe these fluids are, 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 worth, um, are worth considering. And I certainly um, am a big proponent of it, even though I know it's not going to probably make a huge impact, but every little bit, I think, can potentially help. So what about cost? And um, I think you sort of have this idea like, oh man, this balanced solution sounds, you know, like they're going to cost 20 times as much. We won't, we'll just be draining money down the, um, you know, down the sink. So what is the cost of these? So I just did a, a quick search, uh, emails to my hospital and then a good friend of mine, friend of mine's hospital at Northwell. And, and a bag of saline is about um, 30 cents. It's amazing to see like in a one quarter of a, a hospital can spend a million dollars on saline. I mean, cause everyone is getting it. So 31 cents to, to $2, $2, so about a buck. And LR is really not much different. It's about two bucks. Um, and then plasma light is, uh, can be more expensive from $1.60 to $10. Uh, but I, you know, it's, it's not ordered all that commonly. So uh, really the cost should not dissuade you from ordering lactate ringers. So uh, back to myth number two uh, is normal saline the fluid of choice. And I'll say the reality is uh, the balanced solutions may be marginally, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to go out and just say it's like the best thing ever. I mean, it's a pragmatic study. It's a lot of patients, the P value that, what does it really mean? Um, but it ha does show some improved outcomes and uh, considering the magnitude of fluids we use worldwide, it could translate to a large effect. So I, I have switched my practice to, to, to using um, LR um, as my volume resuscitation fluid uh, of choice. So that, that is the two myths. And, um, and to conclude, AKI is a significant problem in ICU, leading to increased morbidity, mortality, and substantial increase in healthcare utilization and cost. Uh, approach to dialysis in the AKI uh, is to wait for indications for refractory medical management to guide initiation. And the use of balanced solutions for volume repletion have a marginally improved outcomes in pragmatic clinical trials. And I want to thank my uh, family for uh, all the support they've given me and also everyone um, in the NEF Twitter community um, and my home institution for supporting me. And thanks, Sam, for inviting me. And I'll take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Sparks. Um, that was great. Um, I think we have time for one question. I think that Api um, asked. Um, he, his question is, you know, the trials that you presented here, did they use mm -hmm. um, fluids during resuscitation? Um, it, is that correct? And then uh, what would be your preferred fluid for maintenance? I think you just mentioned it recently, but I think we'll go for it. Uh, yeah, well, um, I think the first question was about, yeah, so uh, about goal directed resuscitation is that what it was yeah so he what he was asking was the trials that you presented was the scenario of fluid in, in case of fluid resuscitation as opposed to just using maintenance fluids yeah the, i mean these 
they did not tell providers that they had to use these as maintenance. It was up to the discretion of the provider about like when and when not to use it. It, it. Like they didn't, they didn't really go into detail about how to use the fluid. It was just like, Hey, in this month, our ICU, if you're going to use fluids, we have LR. Does that make sense? So um, they weren't giving any directions as to what the goals of the fluid or um, it was completely up to the discretion of the physicians. And then the other question was that, do you have a preferred fluid for maintenance? Huh. So, uh, I mean, maintenance is a tricky question. I feel like you're backing me into a hole there. Uh, you know, if a patient truly needs maintenance, for instance, they're having ongoing losses, like for, they have a, um, you know, a drain that's, you know, they're losing a lot of solute, um, you know, that, I mean, LR would be a preferable uh, fluid. And we'll, you know, if you put someone on saline, you're going to get a metabolic acidosis, you're going to have a pH drop, chloride is going to go through the roof. So yeah, I think LR or any other, um, you know, plasma light would be the fluid of choice. Excellent. Um, I think we're right on target for time. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone for attending today. Um, above all, I'd like to thank Donnie um, and Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen is pretty much the, the heart and soul of uh, ACP Maryland and has been responsible for each and every meeting. Uh, she's pretty much, pretty much guided every chief resident for the past two decades. So you could pretty much say um, she's, she's the heart and soul of ACP. Uh, but we hope you uh, were able to take back pearls from today and apply them to your clinical practice. Um, I'd really like to thank Dr. Marciniak and Dr. Sparks for um, taking the time today and for distilling complex topics in such a simple way. So thank you, everyone. And uh, it, was, it was great to have you.